Awesome. So um, today, you know, as, as they already stated, we're going to talk about, um, you know, what a data lake strategy looks like with AWS, uh, specifically going into depth about the data lake uh, concept and just understanding, you know, what that means as it relates to how you can leverage that with the AWS platform. Um, so brief introduction, I'm Corey Harris, a solutions architect. I've been with AWS for about nine months now. Um, had a lot of experience in financial services prior to AWS. And, uh, you know, I'm excited to help you all um, really deep in the serverless space as well for all of those who may be interested in serverless technology. Um, I'm definitely your guy. Uh, I also have with me Michael Brown. He's our senior solutions architect. Um, he's been with AWS for a number of years now. Um, he has a very deep knowledge of manufacturing, over 20 years of experience. Um, and he'll also be available to, you know, chime in on the presentation as well as the Q&A. We also have Zachary Waters. Um, he's our account man. He's one of our account managers at AWS. Um, you know, he's covering this area. So he'll be a very common name that you'll see, um, you know, in, in the upcoming months. So with that being said, let's dive into, you know, just what a data lake is and kind of get ourselves indoctrinated. So, you know, a data lake, when you think about a data lake, um, I want you to keep in mind the concept of uncurated and, and truly raw, right? So, you know, an a, a easy analogy is when you think about water and you think about, you know, the different flavors and types of water that, that you can get from, you know, a water company, whether it's spring water, purified water, distilled water, essentially it all comes from some central place. That central place is, in this context, a data lake, right? So it's, it's raw, and from there, you have multiple downstream or, you know, plants that take that water and turn it into a certain uh, type for an end, an end customer, right? So when we talk about data lakes, you know, with customers, it's very important that when you build a data strategy that you do have this concept of, you know, I have a central repository for structured and unstructured data, keyword unstructured, right? Um, because, you know, you want to be able to know where your source of truth is at all given times, right? This enables customers um, to really leverage advanced analytics um, and not lose any key insights from their data that they may not have built as a part of a, a data warehouse strategy, right? So, you know, a common concept of the data lake is you store the files as is, right, in their open source form, uh, file formats. Um, so whether the CSVs, log files, streams, et cetera, um, the data lake allows you to store those files as they come in, right? And then we can talk more about what happens once they get there and best practices around that as well. So, you know, why data lake? Why is it important? Um, you know, the, the, the main reason is, you know, one of the reasons is you want to decouple your compute from your storage, right? And this gives you the ability to effectively scale. Um, so what I mean is in the traditional world, right, you know, I came from a Terriator shop and, you know, Terriator is an awesome product, you know, world-class infrastructure, great performance profile. The problem with Teradata or some products like Teradata is just the way that it scales as you grow. So if you want to, you know, add more data into your data warehouse solution, um, one, it's, it's, you know, predefined schema. So it's, it's a little bit of limitation there, but two, from the scaling standpoint, you know, there's no decoupling from your compute and your storage. So those grow in parallel, right? So it doesn't allow you to take advantage of scale without, you know, breaking the bank, if you will. Um, and also another common uh, reason to get a data lake is you want to reduce the complexity in ETL and, op and operational overhead. So think about it this way. Um, you have multiple lines of business. They all maybe use their own technologies. They have their own ETA for when data is available in the data warehouse. They may even have their own definition for the same customer, right? So in my, in, in, you know, in my experience, you know, my last company, you know, each line of business, business insurance, personal, bond, sureties, they had their own definition of what a customer was. And it was very tough to put together a golden record of when the customer leveraged our mobile platform or with interacting with an agent, you know, how do we know what they really have, right? Why do we have to keep bringing them to different departments um, and making the customer experience, uh, you know, less optimal, right? Things of that nature. Those can be mitigated when you have a data lake strategy, right? Because it, it forces the centralization of the data. And now, you know, as a collective, you can have more of a strategic approach as to how you prepare and how you, um, you curate data sets for end customers, right? Um, and again, an, another big piece, and maybe one of even the biggest ones, is 
the future extensibility as new d- d- database technologies and analytic technologies come about, the data lake is not a vendor specific product, right? So we'll talk about what that service is later, but our data lake solution, so this landing zone, if you will, for raw and curated data has no vendor tied data strategy attached to it, right? You don't have to take an AWS specific uh, route to you know, get insights from this data. It's literally just a, a place where you can land data, it scales gracefully, high redundancy and endurance uh, and availability um, for your actual data, right? So again, it gives you the ability to determine you know, what products you wanna leverage when new open source you know, technologies come about, um, you have that agility to be able to leverage those at, at, at will, right? So traditionally, you know, this is kind of what the data strategies look like for most businesses. Um, You had your transactional systems, your ERPs, right, your LOB databases and whatnot. Um, Typically, they were always relational, right, because they were going to a place like Teradata or, you know, another data warehouse solution. Um, You know, you're dealing with terabytes of scale, schema defined prior to load. So there was a limitation on how easily you could ingest new sources. So in the case of mobile or, you know, within the last decade or so, when social media became a buzz for companies to want to gather insights about what customers are saying in regards to feedback about experiences with their platform and kind of mapping it back to, you know, customer engagements and activities, you know, that is is cumbersome with a, a, a solution that's, you know, predefined or a data warehouse solution with a predefined, schema. Um, and also the CapEx, right? So, you know, with these solutions, again, there's a large investment up front. Um, so you kind of front load your cost, uh, you know, and it, it, it puts you in a position where, you know, some companies become, you know, very concerned about how quickly they can return on investment, you know, with that kind of solution. So with the data lake approach, you know, there's this, this notion of decoupling each layer. Um, so as you can see from the bottom, you have a lot more sources that can easily integrate with the data lake because again, the schema is defined on read, not on, on the actual write, Right. So when you land the data in the data lake, really the only concern is just the logical separation that you put the data in. So you want to, and, and, and we won't get into that in depth today. I can definitely take questions on that, but we do have best practices and you know, how do you land data, you know, to make it more effective to do ETL, right, based on the partitioning and letting the data lake technology work in your behalf, right? So there are best practices on that, Um, but there's no schema definitions. You can just throw data in the data lake and, you know, on top of it, we have the notion of cataloging, which basically allows you to build a data dictionary, right? So you can know, uh, you know, what data you have, things of that nature. Um, And again, on top of that, we have services that can leverage that catalog to be able to use that as almost a table of contents, right? Considering the data lake itself has no schema, the catalog is really where those services go to understand where data resides. Um, And that can be data warehouse services, you know, big data services like Elastic MapReduce, um, you know, machine learning services, and also dashboards services that we have, right? So again, this decoupled approach, you know, gives you the ability to determine which route or which analytic journey you want to take um, without the initial investment of, you know, picking a solution and kind of dealing with whatever, you know, journey that solution allows you to have. So, you know, one of the benefits, again, of the data lake is, um, you know, all in one place, right? So as we talked about, um, you know, store and analyze all of your data from all of your sources in one location. Again, it, it just makes it a lot easier when companies are trying to de- to determine, uh, uh, and, you know, an appropriate data strategy or when you're going into the IoT space, right? With all of these new technologies where data streaming and data collection is becoming a necessity for any customer that wants to, you know, for example, prevent uh, failures in their manufacturing plants, Right. We have customers, you know, like Georgia Pacific, who went down that exercise of, you know, they wanted to be able to preemptively prevent outages from their plants. Right. Which directly related to them losing money. If a paper machine goes down, 
if a convertible mill goes down because of tears during the manufacturing process, that's, that's money burned on the table, right? Millions of dollars across over 150 plants, right? So, you know, what they were able to do is say, hey, you know, I want to leverage a data lake solution where I can bring all of any relevant data to kind of help me understand why this, this outage or why these uh, errors occur, right? Why are the, you know, based on the materials, the temperatures, the calibration levels, right? Let's bring all that data in and let's start doing some machine learning and start training models so that our operators can preemptively say ahead of time, you know, we detect that there may need to be some, uh, you know, high level maintenance done to prevent uh, a, a, a wide outage of a machine, right? Um, and with this solution, you know, they were able to pretty much preemptively predict within 60 to 90 days, you know, of when a machine or an outage would have occurred and they can mitigate those actions proactively, right? So this is becoming ever more important for customers um, because again, you know, customers are, are, are trying to grow at scale you want to optimize your resources. So having that data in one place, it really makes it easier to determine, you know, what do you do with it now, right? Um, you know, from an ingest standpoint, you know, because the, the data does not have to be predefined into a schema, right? Um, the ingest, you know, happens rather quickly, right? And we have over 11 different data ingest capabilities within our platform, ranging from streaming to database migration services to, you know, block level replication, um, as well as, you know, the ability to send, you know, a, a device to a customer and load petabyte scale data into a, an actual durable device. And then we load it into um, our actual data center directly, right? So there's a number of different ways that we can bring either massive, small amounts of data, incremental data, um, into the platform, and because the schema on read is the paradigm, um, you don't have a limitation, right, on your ability to at least get it into your ecosystem. Um, and within that, you can determine how to refine, logically separate, um, you know, the data as is. So one of the biggest pieces I've talked about, you know, is the storage versus compute, right? So if you think about it this way, Let's say I'm running some EMR, so Elastic MapReduce, and I have a three-node cluster, um, but I'm bringing in new data sources, right? So my storage footprint is, uh, is ever-growing. Um, if I'm comfortable with the data lake solution, I can remain uh, with a three-node cluster on the EMR side, right? And my storage footprint just naturally grows, right? And it naturally scales on its own. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our technology that allows you to do that. Um, but this is the benefit of a data lake, right? You can decouple, you know, your compute from your storage. You don't have to grow those in parallel. If you don't need massive compute, um, you can still have lightweight compute, but just gather more data. Um, whereas in, in traditional models, you know, that's, you know, a lot harder to accomplish and sometimes impossible. Um, those may have to grow in parallel, which can, of course, spike up, uh, spike up your actual uh, initial investment. So again, like I just spoke about, right, the schema on read, um, very, very important benefit of a data lake. Um, it allows, you know, ad hoc analysis, right, because now what I can do is based on the consumer of data, I can determine which schema they can be exposed to. So, for example, um, what you have the ability to do with the data lake is I can create multiple versions of a data catalog. Right, so I can have the same underlining data lake storage. On top of it, I have multiple data catalogs, and those can be, uh, you know, created based on my consumers. So I may have one data catalog with a version of a schema, and a separate data catalog with a slightly different version of a schema based on who's ever going to be who's going to be consuming that data. Right, so it enables this notion of ad hoc analysis and really giving people different views of the same information, right? I have the same data, but because the abstraction on how I catalog the data and the flexibility I have in me creating these data catalogs for my downstream applications like data warehouse systems or ad hoc querying systems or dashboards, 
or you know a data pipeline for machine learning, I can leverage a, 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 any data catalog at any given time, right? So I can meet the needs of multiple consumers within my enterprise. Again, so it gives you, you know, infinite flexibility on how you can, you know, slice and provide that data. So let's talk a little bit about YWS. So when you think about a data lake, you probably already can tell that it requires a broad set of tools and technologies. And, and the main reason is because the, the, the application set is so diverse, right? So with IoT data streaming, um, you know, with the current pandemic, a lot of companies are leveraging virtual reality or certain levels of augmented reality um, to be able to interface with customers, especially in like the real estate space, the Airbnb space, right? Those kind of industries, you know, data, you know, being able to accommodate that without breaking the bank is huge. I mean, you have to have a platform that's flexible and ready for change at any given time, right? Things that no one would expect to happen, you know, happen in this world and your, your technology needs to be able to allow you to adapt to that so that your business can continue to thrive and you can continue to give, you know, great experience to your customers. So, you know, the typical steps for a data lake, and, and, and again, we'll dive deeper into this, is, you know, you set up your storage solution. We'll talk a little bit about that. You move the data and you cleanse prep catalog. So this is pretty much your ETL. Um, you then configure and, you know, and enforce security and compliance policies. This is important, you know, especially for customers, who, you know, who, are, who have sensitive data sets. So you want to have a platform that allows you to create this fine-grained control um, as well as, you know, the ability to administer these policies with ease and with certain levels of abstraction, depending on how much you want to interface directly with underlining technology and services, right? And then you also want to make the data available for analytics, of course, right? So, you know, data warehousing, you know, third-party marketplace services or, you know, net or, or cloud-native AWS dashboard services. So the, the data lake infrastructure in AWS looks like this at a very high level. Um, we have over 170 services. This is just a subset. But if you take it from the bottom up, we have the ingestion services at the bottom. So this is a subset as well. So as I mentioned, Snowball, Snowmobile, those are for petabyte, exabyte scale migrations. Kinesis is for real-time data streaming. We also have database migration services, um, you know, server migration services as well. Um, and then when you think about the middle, you see S3. This is our simple storage service, and we'll go in depth about that in the next slide, I, I believe. Um, but that is really the data lake, if you will. That's the object storage. That's where you can drop all of your files. Um, it scales naturally. You don't predefine storage or preallocate. Um, it grows based on usage. So that on-demand tiering cost choices really bodes well here because you don't have to uh, – you know, go into a long-term investment when you're leveraging S3 and you're not locked into using AWS products and services. Um, again, the decoupling of compute from storage. So if you look at the top, these are all like what we could consider downstream, you know, services or applications that can hook into your data lake. So SageMaker for data pipeline that's predicated around, you know, training and, and deploying models into production and doing real-time inference. Um, you know, Redshift, our data warehouse solution, you know, on the right side, services like Comprehend on the developer level to be able to do, um, to inject a little bit of AI within your application, right, recognition. Um, so, so, again, you know, these are all services that you're privy to, you know, once you have, you know, a data lake solution and even, you know, open source and third-party services, um, are available to you as well. But at the core, just remember, you know, S3, right, is really that central place of, you know, where your data resides. And from there, um, you have the ability to take it in any direction. So the reason that S3 is a great choice is, you know, one, the durability. So it's designed for 11 nines of durability. So that basically means 99.9 .9, uh, and add nine more nines percent chance that we will not lose your data. The reason is because we actually have built-in fault tolerance and replication across the global infrastructure. So within a given region, right, if you make an S3 bucket is what we call it, um, that underlying block storage is replicated across the availability zones within that region. 
So even in the event of an internal block level failure, it's seamless to a customer, right? We have replicated blocks that will still present that data to you um, and your data will not be, you know, lost in the, in, in the case of a natural disaster. Um, we also have, you know, 99.99% availability. So this is just, you know, how often is the service available? Again, always given access to data. Um, very high, very, very highly performant. So it has different mechanisms to accelerate how you bring data in, um, how it processes data. So multi-part upload is one, range get. Um, very simple to uh, very simple to leverage. Uh, the SDKs, that's the APIs. We have lifecycle policies, so you can tier your data from you know hot data to medium data to infrequently accessed to archival and cold, right? So with each choice comes a cost saving. So giving you choices on how you kind of keep that data in perpetuity. Um, you know, it's highly scalable, so you store as much as you need. Um, you know, scaling of the storage and compute, again, is independent, no minimum usage requirements. And again, it's integrated with all the services you see on the right and many more. Um, you know, we built S3 purposely to serve as a service that integrates with pretty much every service that we have in our platform, right? Um, and this is the reason why it's just a great, you know, choice for using it as the data lake, if you will. So if you look at this this uh, graphic, no need to to be intimidated at all. Um, really, is just kind of showing the benefits and the different uh, areas in which you know you can get value from leveraging the data lake as well as the AWS platform. So when you look at the bottom, you know you have protect and secure. So these are a subset of you know, security services like identity and access management for access controls and uh, key management services for encryption, you know, cloud trail for auditing, right? These are all built in and integrated with, you know, the data lake or S3 um, for short, uh, you know, data ingestion. So there's just a subset of the technologies that we offer and integrate with S3, direct connect for customers who have hybrid architectures, um, who are accessing their data center directly they can get a direct fiber to go directly into AWS uh, for better latency. Um, you know, Snowball, as we already mentioned, database migration service, a number of different ways to bring data into the platform and, and, and just land it. Uh, catalog and search, so DynamoDB, a key value store solution that we have. Elasticsearch, um, again, which is a fully managed uh, search service that we offer, um, you know, from the user, Interface perspective, API gateway, Cognito, right? These are services that can provide, you know, authentication and a, and, a, and a gateway to either ingest data into the platform. So some customers, you know, build ingestion APIs, use an API gateway and Cognito for, for authentication. Um, and this is how they can kind of get data into the platform. So you have a number of different ways to go about it. And then from the right side, you know, there's a number of different products that you can leverage, you know, some AWS, some open source, some marketplace products, right? So real-time analytics, uh, AI and predictive analytics, or AI and predictive modeling, um, you know, BI and data visualization, uh, transaction on RDBMS solutions, and then analytic solutions, right? So again, this, this is not a vendor-specific journey, right? As you might see in, in other providers or other solutions, um, this is a true customer driven approach to how you want to, you know, manage your data strategy. Um, you have full autonomy to talk to professionals. You know, we have a, you know, wide partner network and even internally, you know, we're, all, we're always willing to help you craft out what your strategy may look like. Um, but again, it's always working backwards from, you know, where do you want to go as a customer and not tailoring you to a specific product or limitations with a certain product that you have to work within. So what can you do with the data lake? So here's an, I'm gonna take you through various screenshots of just a subset of the services um, that we have. Feel free to ask questions later. Um, this is a service that we have called Amazon Athena. It's a fully managed query service. It uses native SQL um, and it goes against the data lake directly using Glue as you know almost a data catalog. Um, and it has a similar experience with anyone familiar with Hive um, for anyone that, you know, using, using, using Hadoop now. Um, so again, it, you know, it gives you the ability to do ad hoc querying, no sort of setup, 
Um, you can just open the Athena console and run some queries. So this is really good for ad hoc analysis, um, you know, for customers. Definitely something to consider when, you know, thinking about data lake strategy and where it fits in. Um, EMR is another, you know, common pattern that we see. So, you know, Hadoop on Amazon EMR, our Elastic MapReduce service, this is more so, you know, for a lot more custom and, you know, more heavy intensive operations you may want to perform in your data lake. So maybe you're doing some, you know, data transformation or some complex, you know, queries across some data sources and you want to run, you know, EMR, um, you have that option with our Elastic EMR, with our Elastic MapReduce service. Um, we also have visualizations within QuickSight. So this is the... Uh, a fully managed dashboard service, right? So you, you know, you can provision a dashboard, you can hook in um, either views from a database, uh, uh, you know, um, or you can, you know, hook in queries or other integrations from, from systems to feed data into the quick, the quick site dashboard. Um, and again, it gives you a nice interactive and easy way to visualize data that lives in AWS. Um, very easy to provision, very lightweight, um, you know, a great avenue for, you know, reporting for either executive teams or, you know, any sort of uh, sales-related reporting. Um, one of my favorites is StageMaker. So, you know, I've, I've personally enjoyed the data pipeline conversation and kind of exploring, you know, how do I create an effective data pipeline in AWS. StageMaker is a fully managed um, machine learning service that we offer where you can build and uh, train models and also deploy them into production, um, you know, via an endpoint that, that you'll get from SageMaker. Um, you know, it stands up a cluster on your behalf. So it gives you the Jupyter Notebook experience. So you can do, you know, again, you, you can perform your ETL in SageMaker. Um, and again, you can curate data sets, train your models, deploy them, um, you know, do your real-time inference. So again, another avenue for, you know, downstream processing with SageMaker. So here's the data catalog that we talked about a little bit earlier. So, um, you know, this is AWS Glue, our fully managed ETL service. Um, within Glue, you have the ability to create these uh, data catalogs by using crawlers that actually crawl against your data lake, right? So once they, you have your crawler job, it runs, it gives you a inferred schema, if you will, on what it found Within Glue, it has hooks to understand all open, pretty much all open source file formats like CSV, JSON, text files, um, even compressed uh, formats like Avro, Parquet, RC, um, you know, GZIP, et cetera, right? So um, it has the ability to understand a lot of the most commonly used formats and give you uh, a classification, tells you where they're located, um, and it makes databases within the catalog, which store within the database that has metadata around the tables that it found to support that data, uh, that database, right? So this is where you would go or where, you know, you would hook your downstream applications to, to understand how to access certain data, right? Uh, and again, this is, you know, pretty much, I would say uh, one of the main important pieces of your data lake, because you want to understand, you know, how you're trans, you're transforming that data, how you're making it available right, for your end customers. And then, you know, of course, load into downstream services. So, you know, again, talked about SageMaker, you know, Elasticsearch, you know, it, it provides real-time analytic capabilities. Um, Amazon Aurora is our, is our own internal database solution that we created um, to kind of solve for customers who wanted commercial-grade performance um, without the commercial-grade cost, if you will. So. Um, it's a great solution to look into, you know, whenever a customer is looking to build a data strategy, it has, you know, uh, a, a high level of redundancy and availability. Um, and I feel like, you know, most customers would get a lot of value out of, you know, exploring with Aurora. Um, Redshift is, you know, on the data warehouse side. So, you know, doing deep, complex analytics against petabytes of structured data, um, Redshift. And again, DynamoDB, NoSQL database, key value store. Uh, you know, millisecond latency at any scale. I've seen DynamoDB personally used um, as like a, almost like a lookup layer for APIs, similar to how you would use a cache 
Um, because again, of the key value nature, let's say you're running a machine learning pipeline, you've done some pre some pre computed, uh, you know, analysis, um, you may want to store that somewhere so that if you don't have to, you know, replicate that same process in real time. So, you know, DynamoDB is a good, you know, avenue to take there. So again, you know, that was the overview of, you know, data lake technologies, you know, on AWS. Again, you know, here is the broad spectrum of, you know, everything that data lake has to offer. Um, again, you know, as Jeremy stated, we're definitely looking forward to, you know, understanding, you know, what avenue, you know, customers, you know, most relate to or would like to dive deeper into. Because again, the data lake conversation is a is a very wide conversation. Um, there's a lot of moving parts there, and it's a, it's always important to first have an understanding of the the concept of what a data lake can provide but then also diving deep into certain spokes or downstream, um, you know, processes, like whether you're a shop that's looking to build a strong data pipeline to support machine learning, um, or whether you're looking to have a pipeline to provide data to, you know, internal business users uh, via data warehouse solution, um, or if you're just looking to have a general data strategy where you can kind of just have a way to have flexibility and, and just understand how you can mature that incrementally over time, right? So all of those things, again, you know, are very relevant. Um, but my goal for today is just to kind of, you know, plant the seed on, you know, how customers, you know, should be thinking about how they should, in, in, you know, enhance their data strategy as we move more into, um, one, unpredictability around, you know, just the world itself and being able to be in a position where your technology can allow you to respond in the event that you have to compensate um, on behalf of your customers, right? So again, as I spoke about the shift in a lot of usage in virtual reality, augmented reality, um, you know, there's just been a large shift in just the need to have, uh, you know, a, a, a large scale of data, um, IoT as well. Um, you know, customers are relying more on insights that they're getting from devices, you know, even during the crisis. So, again, understanding, you know, how you position yourself, uh, you know, internally based on your own strategy is, is always a conversation that we're willing to have um, and that all customers should be considering, um, you know, as they evolve um, internally. So with that. That's all I have as far as presentations. Um, I'll open it up for any Q&A or questions from the group. Thanks a lot, Corey. That was great. Uh, yeah, so anybody, feel free to fire away. We've got some great people from Amazon here today, and it's uh, wide open for anything that, that you'd like to discuss with them. There. This is uh, Billy with Pack Health. Um, just a quick question. I'm I'm actually a, a big relational database fan, so I've I've been in that world for a long time. Um, and in the company that we're at now, we have a lot of data that's coming in that because of the speed needed for the apps, um, you know, it's like a constant conversation about whether we make it relational or we we put it in like a JSON B column in the in our Postgres database. So I wonder if you have any suggestions on kind of moving from that model into a data lake. Would you just like throw it straight as JSON files into the data lake or you have like a migration kind of thought process on that? Uh, yeah, sure. So I'll take a stab at this one. Um, and Michael, if you have anything, I'm definitely interested to hear what you have to say as well. Um, the way I would think, the way I would think about it um, is, you know, depending on the requirements for your business, um, you know, if you have a, a, a requirement for low latency access to this data, um, I would really, I would be interested to know how is this data produced. So is this data coming from 
um, like, you know, transactional systems that you have? Is it like an application that you're running? Like what, what, what type of data we're talking about here? Well, most of the time it's, so we, we have a, an army of lambdas that are, you know, pulling data from a couple of different relational sources or, mm -hmm. or they'll, they'll pull, you know, the JSON will store it um, as JSON so it's easy for them to get and use up in, um, up in the lambdas is kind of the, the biggest way we end up creating and using that JSON. Okay. Um. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, interesting. So, you how, know, how fast, way, how fast from when you pull the data, or when the data uh, is, you know, is ingested till uh, when you need to consume the data out of an application? What's your, what's your well, I think um, from the, I'm sorry, did you say from the time that it's created or until the time that it's used? Yeah, I mean, are we talking, is it, does it need to be seconds, to, is minutes or hours? Like how, how fast do you need to report on it or, or, or consume it for when it's generated? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so it varies. Sometimes, you know, we're, we're pulling data that could, could be days old, um, but sometimes it's like, oh, you know, we created this in this system. So now we have a Lambda that will, you know, ship it over to this other system. So I'm sure that's like, a, oh no, that's why you need a day late for that piece. <laughs> <laughs> but you know so it, it varies but for a lot of our apps we want to be able to get the data that we need and then we need to be able to present it in usually a second is kind of our our benchmark that we try to strive for yeah I mean and so it's really going to be based on that use case so a, a data lake is going to be a, a fantastic um, you know, single source of truth for all of that data in its native schema or its native format. So if it's in JSON, if it's relational, um, you know, if it's relational, you can drop it down as a CSV or a tab delimited or, or some sort of delimited file, or you can convert it to JSON uh, after it gets there. But, you know, that's where, that's where it goes. And then depending on, you know, and we have other use cases, you know, we might use something like Kinesis or Kafka for streaming data in order to get things faster. So I have a I have a customer that that went from, you know, um, what I'll call a vintage model uh, uh, data architecture, you know, very large, big iron um, data warehouses, multiples of them, and you know they went to the data lake strategy. So they kind of peeled off, you know, in ones and twos and threes all the data sources, and sometimes they they paralleled them. They they kept it going to the old um, system and they put a new stream into the data lake. And as they started building up, um, some of them, they just did batch copies, you know, hours, days. And then sometimes they're like, you know what? We need real-time telemetry on this. So something like Google Analytics off the website. You know, it's a, it's a, a you know, big retail website. So they want that telemetry very, very fast. So um, they, used, they actually modified it and used Kinesis to stream that data in, in uh, you know, tens of megabytes a second. And they use a Kinesis Analytics to query, you still using SQL, to query that real-time stream and get real-time analytics. And then at the end of that stream, it's actually still dumping it in to S3. So they're, they're able to kind of adjust to what their use case is based on, um, you know, but still using the same data, right? So you can, you can adjust. That's the, that's the great point of this is you're not fixed because you just bought a product and you have to live within that product. You actually can use all of the tools that surround S3 in order to uh, meet your business goals. Awesome, thank you. Great question, uh, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Feel free to, to jump in. I mean, we can really. Is there a, I have a question. So um, this is Jared. I work with Compassion International. Um, I'm curious if there is a, um, a point in which, you know, the amount of data that you have to throw into a data lake is really not enough to um, Justify a data lake, I guess, for in terms of you know. So I know, like you know, the the, the end end result is you know, or, or 
most cases it's just all thrown it into S3. But, um, you know, is there a point where you're, it's a data lake, you know, like overkill? So, I mean, the amount of data you're storing, you know, you talked about it being for, you know, petabytes and exabytes, which is or terabytes and, and, and exabytes and all that. So what, you know, is it still good for, for much smaller data sets? Yeah. So, you know, and, and I'll take a swag at this one. So what I've seen in customers is, um, you know, I have some customers who have uh, a small footprint in, in AWS um, and they have maybe a data footprint of, you know, maybe a couple hundred gigs, if you will. Um, but the reason of the data lake is not really predicated on the size. It's more so the standardization and the process that you can leverage to be able to standardize how you're accessing your data. So whether you have, you know, a couple gigs or you have, you know, a hundred gigs or either a, either a terabyte, really the, the power of the data lake is one, the cost um, and the, and the complexity doesn't, you know, grow or, you know, prevent you from creating the data lake, right? If you want to produce some sort of insights from that data with an RDBMS or, you know, a data warehouse, um, you know, you can still go through those same motions with a terabyte of data or, you know, 10 gigs of data, you know, and it's not going to uh, be something that you pay for up front, right? So the storage that you leverage and the cost that you pay for the storage and even the downstream services is all depending on how much data and usage that you're bringing to those services. So, you know, for customers who are running a, you know, a hundred terabyte data warehouse or data lake strategy, you know, their costs are going to be a lot different than someone who's just running maybe a hundred gigs or 50 gigs. But the benefit of even in that latter example, you know, having a pipeline where you have visibility to your ETL, um, you know, you have visibility to how you're actually processing data from a downstream perspective. Um, it's still valuable in any use case, in my opinion. Mike, do you have any opinion on that? Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think there's, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, there's no job too big, there's no job too small, uh, because the value comes with, you know, number one, you don't, if it's really small uh, data set, it's a really small price point to, to be able to use it. But you're still getting the benefit of using the, the pipeline and the pattern so that you can allow multiple parts of your business to operate on the same data, the same truth, in whichever way they deem necessary. Um, I have a, uh, I have another customer that, you know, they, they, they ingest, they started with, uh, they actually have a lot of machines that they're monitoring uh, all around the world. And they started with 10 machines, bringing that data in to S3. So they bring in, uh, you know, the performance data and the alarm data, you know, there's, there's collecting some information could as easily be financial transactions or, you know, uh, telemetry from their website. So they started with 10 machines, they built the pipeline and then they went to a partner that had a, that their solution was based on a SQL server and they go, okay, well, what do we do? Well, we've got the data in S3 and we're doing what we want to do with that. Guess what? we can transform that data in S3 and inject it into that SQL Server solution and keep on moving, right? So that it gives them the opportunity to choose products and tools and solutions um, and plug them in to that existing source of truth. And so now that, you know, that started with 10 machines, which was only a couple of a couple hundred megabytes total, uh, you know, after three months. And now they've got uh, several hundred machines on that system and it's working just the same. And the partner that has that SQL Server box, they charge for storage. They charge, the larger that data source gets, the, the more they charge. So they're able, the customer is able to only load the necessary data into that SQL Server versus using that SQL Server for the source, source, of, source of truth um, as you might have to do in a, in, a, in a legacy approach. So the data lake, it could be big or small, and it doesn't reduce your choices of, of what uh, you know what products and services you want to use down the road. All right, cool. Uh, we're we're um, using it. Uh, we're, we're fixing to help a team migrate into our uh, 
our account structure and and this was uh kind of timely for me to kind of wrap my brain a little bit more around um you know data lake pipelines and how data flows between different uh and what different all the different tools are and things of that nature so uh this was a uh, great info thank you guys for uh, putting this on yeah great question thanks for joining I guess something else to consider. So we mentioned that this is the first of a two-part series. Uh, Corey will be back with us again next month. And what we'd like to do in the June session is get into more of a deep dive of an actual example implementation or some example uses of a number of the AWS services toward these, toward some use cases or you know, toward a, a data lake implementation. So. Anybody that, that, that's in today, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on some specific examples maybe that you'd like to see or specifics of an AWS service and a, you know, a hands-on, more tactical demonstration of, of that implementation and you know, give us some ideas of how we can tailor content in the, the next more technical session to something useful for you all. Um, yes, David Rutherford uh, with HC3. Um, I guess a general question with data laking. Um, more on ABS service type question. If, for example, you had a large uh, amount of PDF document, what um, other than, you know, I guess uh, there's probably some machine learning solutions, is there anything, any existing AWS service built for scanning and analyzing data out of document level that would be, you know, usable in a data lake site situation like that. So um, we do have a couple of services. Um, one that I've used quite a bit uh, was one called text extract. I don't know if you've used that before. Um, text extract mm -hmm. is the um, AI service, one of our developers, uh, one of our developer services. And it's kind of like OCR, but it has machine learning built in. Um, what it does is, depending on the structure of the PDF, um, you can extract certain table or column uh, or label type of fields from a PDF, um, depending on, again, the structure of where the data you're trying to extract is located within that PDF. Um, but, text, but text extract is a good starting point, um, you know, just to kind of play around with and see what you can get back from, you know, running that against um, your PDF documents. Um, other than test extract, uh, I would say recognition is also a good one. It depends on, again, what you're looking for. Um, I've used recognition personally with, you know, getting information from like images and driver's licenses. So I'm pretty sure you might be able to wiggle recognition. It would just depend on, you know, exactly what type of data you were looking to get from that right. PDF. Um, but those two in my mind come, are the, are the first two that come to my mind. Uh, Mike, do you have any suggestions there? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, so, you know, we've used Textract to uh, look at PDF documents. And so, uh, again, my, some of my uh, are manufacturing based, but I had a, had a customer had a QA form that they, that they would fill out handwritten. Right. So it was a handwritten QA form. And so what would happen is they would turn that into the quality department. It would take up to 10 days for it to get put into the system, which was SAP at the time. So we used TextTrack to take a picture of that thing, save it as a PDF, and they would actually extract all the data and uh, post it into SAP from TextTrack. Um, I got another customer that uses TextTrack to pull documents, information out of uh, PDF and Word files. And they run that. They then take that data set and run it through Comprehend. Uh, Comprehend is another AI service, just you know, similar to Text Track, but it's a, um, uh, but you know, but it does it does word index, word count, it does um, sentiment analysis, uh, it does contextual analysis of the document, and so it gives you a lot of metadata about the document, and uh, also gives you a word index so that you can actually put, uh, put that into something like Elasticsearch. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a there's a there's a lot of different tools uh, that you can use to to work with, and if it doesn't exactly meet what you're doing, then you then you can go into the machine learning, uh, you know, and, and cut, do some custom training and all that stuff. Right. So, but basically, I guess the general routine with something like that would be running a service like that, 
to extract the data, and that data would, would then also reside in the data lake and would be searchable at that point. It wouldn't be something where you would initiate a query and it would, you know, go and do a just search of a document. You'd have to run something ahead of time to pre-end that. Exactly. And then and then we've got another service. Corey, I don't know if you've dug into it a little bit, but we've got another service for enterprise search called Kendra. So think about it yeah. as an enterprise search engine with machine learning built in. So, you know, depending on your use case, uh, you know, Amazon Kendra might also be an opportunity. Okay. Great. Great. So other questions or ideas of, of topics for greater depth uh, for next session? I, I did see that Billy uh, posted a couple notes into the chat. Uh, certainly things we can, I, I think, great input and we can uh, take into consideration for designing next month's content. Any other ideas or requests? This might be a restatement of the, of the first question or the first um, sample, but it seems to be a pretty common scenario where small businesses have some third party systems and some internal applications that are storing data in structured databases, but in disparate databases. And uh, the question is, is there a, does Amazon have a solution for um, efficiently ingesting data from these various structured data sources, keeping in mind that, that those rows are not just written once, they're potentially updated, but ingesting all that data and keeping it updated in a central source of truth. And is a, is a data lake a good fit for that or is there something else that would fit that better? Yeah, so, um, you know, on that note, we have a, a service uh, that, that that's called Database Migration Service. Um, and what this service does is uh, it creates uh, source and target endpoints, and then you create it creates under the hood a replication instance. So basically, what you'll what you'll have is you have your source database on the far left. Um, your replication instance would connect into that source database via the source endpoint, and within the database migration service, you can configure ongoing replication. Um, or you can just do a full load, right? So you have flexibility in how you want to handle the migration. So if, for example, I'm storing that data from a target standpoint in S3, um, you know, I can do something such as, you know, configure my target is S3, which is the data lake. Maybe I want to, you know, retain the column headers so that I can already have some insight into what some of the fields are named. Um, and when I start that migration task, that data is going to continually be pumped into my target for a specified amount of time based on my migration job, right? So that's a pretty lightweight way that you could essentially have multiple databases that are feeding data on an ongoing basis um, into your actual target. The only thing to keep in mind that I've seen is that I had a customer who, you know, we did this exercise on an SAP migration and because the database migration service uses the native APIs, the CDC transaction logs to, um, to do the replication, you want to be careful of any sort of forced truncation of tables on the source side and then rebuilding of tables because that will also take place during the replication. So, for example, my customer, you know, every night they tore down tables and then they rebuilt them. So we kind of had to work around that. And there's ways to work around things like that. Um, but just keep in mind that the database migration service integrates directly with the CDC logs of that native system. So it's going to give you everything just as it's performing on your source. And then, you know, effectively replicate that out to the target um, to keep those in sync. Thanks. That, that sounds like it might be a, a great fit for what I was describing. And, and just a point of clarification, I'm just glancing through the documentation there. It's you, you can ingest data from multiple data source types like, you know, Oracle or SQL Server or MySQL all into, say, a Postgres target. Is that correct? Yes. yes. And we also have a tool called Schema Conversion Tool, which kind of plays nice with database migration service. So Schema Conversion Tool is a free tool. Um, now, this typically is, let's say you wanted to, again, to your example, take Oracle um, and bring it into Postgres. So you wanted to do a, a, you know, a heterogeneous migration. Um, the schema conversion tool 
one helps you understand the scope of the migration effort and what conversions can be done automatically um, and what conversions uh, need to be done manually, right? So it builds your report um, and it gives you visibility to be able to scope out, you know, all of the functions, all of the changes to your objects, any sort of um, logic you've created um, and how it makes its way over to the target, right? So that's kind of the, the you know, schema conversion tool really is essential, especially in the case of a heterogeneous migration, just giving you that visibility, um, allowing you to have that report, uh, seeing all of your objects and functions and types and just knowing with integrity that you're gonna be able to bring everything over um, effectively. Okay, thanks. All right, so yep. we're coming up on the hour. Um, we uh, just want to re remind everybody of next month's session. We will be following up on this topic with a more technical deep dive. Uh, I encourage anybody to reach out afterwards if you have ideas or requests for that. We'd love to hear them. Uh, also taking um, suggestions for upcoming sessions over the next few months. We have a few booked out and we're hoping to announce a several month advanced slate of our sessions in the next couple of weeks. Uh, there's still a few openings and we'd love to have others from the community doing demonstrations in that. Uh, it's certainly good to get a diversity of, of topics and input from our from our own group. So we'd love to hear any ideas, requests for topics of future sessions or any volunteers to do a presentation would be great. Justin has posted into the chat the winners of the Uber Eats store prizes for the month. So please reach out to him with your email and he can follow up with you on that. We'll be posting a recording of this session on our YouTube channel. I'll send that out probably later today or tomorrow to all attendees and to the, the Birmingham AWS meetup in general. Thanks again, everyone, for, for joining. It's been terrific having great uh, participation from, from the local community and keeping this alive as we've been all remote for a while and we look forward to, to keeping it going next month. See you all then.